Anyone else? No. Anyone else? Bhave, in the material creation. Asmin, this, Klishyamananam, of those who are suffering from avidya. Nations, kama, desire, karma bihi, by execution of food of work, shravana, hearing, smarna, remembering, arhani, worshipping, karishyan, may perform, et, thus, kechana, others. So Queen Kunti, she is speaking to Krishna. Krishna is standing right there and she's talking to him directly. And uh, she's offering beautiful prayers, glorifying the Lord. The most famous prayer we all are much aware of is I'll read that prayer. It's... Uh, Oh, we all know that prayer. It's the f the one that nobody likes to play. <laughs> Vipada santu tasasva tatra tatra jagat guru bhavato darshanam yat sat apurna bhava darshanam. I wish that all those calamities would happen again and again so that we could see you again and again. For seeing you means that we will no longer see repeated birth and death. So she's she's famous for this prayer that she's praying for things to go wrong. <laughs> How many of us pray for things to go wrong? <laughs> Nobody. But why is she praying like that? Because she has everything on the material level. She has wonderful family, children, opulence, respect, position. But she says, these things make me forget you. <laughs> so I need some difficulties in my life. That way I can remember you. It's, uh, it's, a, fa it's a fact of life that when difficulties come, we become closer to God, right? <laughs> and he used to say, there's no, no atheists in the foxholes during the wars. You know, when one's life could go at any second, even the atheists would pray. <laughs> so, yeah, so calamities are actually God sent to help us become more Krishna conscious. <laughs> and that's, that's what we want. That's what the idea is to become more Krishna conscious or more attached to Krishna. Now, she goes on to glorify Krishna. And then, towards the end, in the section where we're at, she's, um, she's conjecturing, speculating why, not speculating, but just giving different reasons why you've come. Why do you come to this material world? Some people say you come for the glorification of the pious kings and King Yadu. Others say you came because of Vasudeva and Devi pray, Devaki prayed for you. Others say you came to, uh, you know, uh, relieve the burden of the earth, like that. And now, in this prayer, she says another. She keeps saying different reasons. All the answers, all the prayers that she's saying are actually correct. Krishna comes for all these reasons. But here she says. And yet, others say that you appear to rejuvenate the devotional service of hearing, remembering, worshipping, and so on, in order that the conditioned soul suffering from material pangs might take advantage and gain liberation. 
Uh, she's saying here, you came to bring back the uh, importance of devotional service by rejuvenating it and making it important again in the lives of people in the world. Prabhupada's purport. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Lord asserts that he appears in every millennium just to establish the way of religion. The way of religion is made by the Supreme Lord. No one can ma manufacture a new path of religion. That is the fashion for certain ambitious persons. The factual way of religion is to accept the Lord as the supreme authority and thus render service unto him in spontaneous love. A living being cannot help but render service because one is constitutionally made for that purpose. The only function of the living being is to render service to the Lord. The Lord is great and the living beings are subordinate to him. Therefore, the duty of all living beings is just to serve him only. Unfortunately, the illusion living beings out of misunderstanding only become servants of the senses by material desire. This desire is called avidya or nescience, or another word, ignorance. And out of such desire, the living being makes different plans for material enjoyment centered around a perverted sex life. He therefore becomes entangled in the chain of birth and death by transmigrating in different bodies on different planets under the direction of the Supreme Lord. Unless, therefore, one is beyond the boundary of this ignorance, one cannot get free of the threefold miseries of material life. That is the law of nature. The Lord, however, out of his causeless mercy, because he is more merciful to the suffering living beings than they can expect, God is more merciful than we actually understand, he appears before them and rejuvenates the principles of devotional service comprised of hearing, chanting, remembering, serving, worshiping, praying, cooperating, and surrendering unto him. Adoption of all of the above-mentioned items or any one of them can help the conditioned soul get out of the tangle of nations and become liberated from all material sufferings created by the living beings and illusioned by the material energy. This particular type of mercy is bestowed upon by the living beings, by the Lord, in the form of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki jai. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Kena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Nyena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Jitnama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachadine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So here those that the Lord's very merciful. Um, God is great. We say God is great. And that's a common statement. But when you say God is great, it doesn't really tell you much. Greater than what and what is greatness. So actually greatness is something that is a feature of a person's character or a feature of a person's activity. So God is all powerful. He's all wealthy. He's all famous. He's all... What else? Strength. He has the complete strength. He is all knowledgeable. He's also very renounced. He doesn't need any of these things because he's satisfied in himself. God has everything. But one thing he shows that is beyond his, not beyond, but something in addition which really makes him great. Because all these things are nice, 
But if he's not one other thing, none of these things matter. And what is that one feature? He's kind. <laughs> he's very kind. So that kindness alone makes all his other opulences wonderful. But if he's not kind, then what is the use? Just like if you know, know a very big person in the world, and he has a lot of money, and he has a lot of position, a lot of, what we say, opulences, and he can do many, you know, interesting things, but he's not kind, who cares? <laughs> Nobody's interested, right? And you find that a lot of times people are, they have a lot and maybe become proud of that and then they use other people to uh, take advantage and try to increase their opulences. But Krishna wants to share his opulences with everyone and at the same time he wants to make sure everyone's happy. <laughs> it says, Prabhupada said, if you're happy, that's a good way to serve Krishna. <laughs> Just by being happy is pleasing to Krishna. Happy, of course, in devotional service. Because devotional service is, is susukam, kartam, avyayam. It is the principle of ultimate and complete happiness. But because we get entangled in the material energy and we let that material energy become our main concern how to manipulate the material energy, how to fulfill our desires on the material level with friends, family members, position, wealth, popularity, so many things. We make these things important or more important in our relationship with God. And therefore, we're not happy. <laughs> well, then we're not happy. So by pushing all these other things aside and just developing your relationship with God, everything becomes wonderful. <laughs> because God is more eager for that relationship than you are. <laughs> it's interesting. He wants us more than we want him. It's interesting. He could, and he has everything, too, at the same time. So at the same time, he doesn't need us. But a person whose nature is by nature kind and loving wants to give that love to others and have, wants that person to benefit from that love. So that's Krishna. He's more eager to share his kindness and his loving relationship with us than we are. We're so busy trying to manipulate this material world in different ways, trying to adjust our material situation so we can find some kind of peace or happiness or stability in this world. But we're overlooking the main thing, and that is the way our relationship with Krishna. And if we, by making our relationship with Krishna stronger, and here's the process right here. It says here, Queen Kuti said, and others say you've appeared to renew, rejuvenate the devotional service by hearing about you, remembering you, worshiping you. And Prabhupada extends that in the purport by mentioning all the nine limbs of bhakti, the nine angas. And he says, if, even if you become good at one of them and focus on one, you can get out of the suffering of material energy. But we don't want to get out of the suffering of material energy. We want to somehow or other get some happiness from our material perspective and be Krishna consciousness at the Krishna at the, at the same time. And that may happen, but only when you put Krishna first. If you put material things first, and because the common principle of people in the material world is to use God to support their material arrangements. That's why most, most, and we say most, the large majority, people become God conscious in order to have a better material life. <laughs> because they failed to do it by themselves and now they take up God so God can help them become really happy in whatever way they offer their prayers to God, this way or that way. But a devotee doesn't care about these material things. He adjusts his material things in order so 
he can somehow or other have time, energy, and enthusiasm to worship God. So material things can help one to stabilize one's position in such a way that we can maximize our relationship with God. But they're not the main thing. Because even if you don't have any stability in your material life, you can still be fully God conscious and find complete satisfaction and happiness in that. It was one, uh, Prabhupada tells the story of Lomasa Yogi. He was a powerful yogi. And he had a benediction that he could live a one life of Brahma for every, ha every hair he had on his head. And Prabhupada said he was a very hairy sage. <laughs> And so he had some followers, but he had nothing. He, he just lived on the banks of the holy rivers, and he would do his prayers and chanting meditation there. And so his followers, they were concerned that their guru wasn't getting enough you know, material facilities. So they offered, Guru Maharaj, can we build you a house? He said, don't bother, I'm not going to be here that long. In other words, he was thinking, it's just, why bother with all these material things? Because life is short. And he had the benediction of living for so many lifetimes of Brahma. So life is short. And we don't have that minute's time. So to maximize our process of Krishna consciousness, one has to hear and chant the, the glories of the Lord as much as possible. And that's where our, that's where our fulfillment is. Satam prasangam mamavirya samvido bhavanti hitkarna rasayana kata najosinat yat vat karv najosinat yat bhaktir bhaktir anukramishyati <laughs> This verse is from the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, spoken by Kapila Dev. No, actually, it's not spoken by Kapila Dev. It's spoken by, uh, who is that? I think it's spoken by Kedarma Muni or Lord Brahma, I'm not sure. But in that verse, it says, Satam prasangam mamavirya sambhido. Bhavanti rit karna, rit means ear, and karna means, rit means heart, and karna means ear. So the hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord in the association of others who are enthusiastic to do it is, is the supreme nectar. Because when one tastes the ha happiness of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, one gets lost in that. Maharaj Pariksit had how many days to live? Seven. And what did he do? All of a sudden, from... He was living as a king of the world, had everything, power, prestige, influence, wonderful family. Everything was ideal. But somehow, by Krishna's arrangement, he was cursed to lose everything and die within a week. He didn't complain. He didn't try to salvage his material life in any way. He just left everything, went down to the banks of the Ganga, and started to hear or, or to meditate on the Lord. This attracted the attention to, of great sages from all over the universe. All over the universe. Oh, the king of the world has given up his position. Now he's meditating, and soon he will leave the world. Let us go. So they all came, and it's described. So many sages came. And out of all them, one great personality came, Sukadev Goswami. 16-year-old boy, had nothing in materially. He didn't even have any clothes. He had nothing. And he came, and when he came amongst the assembly, everyone stood up in honor of this person. He was such a great soul. And he took the position of the seat of honor, and then... He asked Maharaj Pariksit, how can we serve you in your last days? 
He said, I want to hear the glories of the Lord. That's all. Just give me the glories of the Lord. And so, Sukadeva Goswami was enthusiastic because the speaker becomes enthusiastic when the hearer wants to hear. The more enthusiasm comes from the hearers, the more the speaker becomes enthusiastic automatically by the power of the Lord within the heart. And he starts to narrate Srimad Bhagavatam canto after canto. Six days he finishes nine cantos. One more day's left. He hasn't got to the tenth canto. He's not eating. He's not sleeping. He's not, you know, taking any water, anything. He's so absorbed in hearing the glories of the Lord that Sukadeva Goswami said, Maharaj, would you like a little rest, some water? Then his immediate response was, oh, now is the tenth canto. This is what I'm waiting for, Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. He was so eager. He was eagerness even increased when he heard it was coming to the tenth canto. And Sukadeva Goswami started to narrate even more enthusiastically. And at the end of seven days, he just was completely self-realized, had not the slightest bit of fear of death, he understood his position and relationship to Krishna. He developed pure love for Krishna. He was ready to go on to the spiritual world. His mother was there. She came, Ut Uttara. She said, son, son, what did Sukadev Goswami say? I want to hear. I'm your mother. Please. You know, sometimes mothers, they, they want you to share whatever your good fortune is, and that's nice. <laughs> So he said, Mother, I don't have time. <laughs> I'm soon to meet my destiny. She said, give me something. <laughs> so he narrated what is now known as Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, which is the essence of the Srimad Bhagavatam. He took the essence and narrated it, and later that became the, the famous Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, Later on, put down on paper by Sanatana Goswami. So, yeah. This is the process, to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. And the more we can do that, the more we can find happiness in Krishna consciousness. Material, we have so many responsibilities to do our services, to maintain our bodies. But these things shouldn't be the main thing in our life. And our success will never depend on how good we are in these things. Therefore, Prabhupada said, you know, just hear and chant the glories of the Lord as much as possible and engage in devotional service accordingly. And he said, this is the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He has come to hear and chant. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's God. It's all about him. But now he's in the role of his own devotee. So what does he do? He goes to his disciple, not disciple, but actually associate, Gadadhar Pandit. And Gadadhar Pandit loved to read Srimad Bhagavatam. He would read it all day. Someone came to Prabhupada and said, they were complaining. Prabhupada, there's one devotee here he doesn't do any service. He just reads all day. And Prabhupada said, is he sleeping? Prabhupada, the boy said, no, he's reading. Prabhupada said, very well, very good. <laughs> very good. <laughs> so, yeah. So Mahaprabhu went to Gadadhar Pandit and said, please read Trimad Bhagavatam. I want to hear about those two great devotees, Pallad Maharaj and Dhruva Maharaj. And so Gadadhar Pandit would narrate the pastimes and he would read the whole pastime of each of those personalities and then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would say, read it again. And then he would read it again and Mahaprabhu would say, 
read it again. And he would read it again. And Vrindavan Das Thakur, the author of Chaitanya Bhagavan, explains he would read it up to a hundred times. The Mahaprabhu would listen. Mahaprabhu, in the role of a pure devotee of the Lord, is both teaching, but he's also relishing the pastimes of the great souls who have given their lives for to him in pure devotional service. So he's finding great happiness in that. So Prabhupada said, I have written so many books, so many books, please read them. <laughs> Hear them more and more. And this way your life will become happy simply by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord as much as possible. And especially the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Prabhupada said, 16 rounds is just a, a minimum. When we go on, uh, when we give initiations, now we ask the persons who are taking initiation, do you agree to chant at least 16 rounds? It's not like it's maximum, it's minimum. Because if you chant 16 rounds every day nicely, especially early in the morning, you'll develop a taste for chanting. And as you develop a taste, you want to chant more. And then it becomes something that you look forward to more and more. Oh, I get a chant to chant more and more and more. And you find happiness in that. So the great souls have come to give us the glories of the Lord, and they want us to, to take that mercy to hear and chant the glories of the Lord more and more and to inspire others to do the same. And this is our process of Krishna consciousness. Whatever service that we are doing is an expression of the quality of our chanting and hearing. When we're chanting and hearing nicely, we will be eager to do service more and more. Okay, any questions, comments? Yes, yeah, from, what is your name again? Hemangi Gopi Devi Dasi. Hemangi? Gopi. Gopi Devi, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for a very nice class. I'm just wondering, because in the Bhagavad Gita it is explained that there are four main reasons why somebody approaches to, to, to God, mm -hmm. and one of that is to get wealth. And mm. then how we can distinguish when someone really approach and practicing, 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 still in the process, but still um, it looked like from outside that he really wants to like serve devotees and develop devotion, but actually in the end it's covered with that uh, very materialistic That material desire, desire is yes. still there. Yes, yes. Generally we, we, we understand that that People are attracted by one or the uh, one or more of these four reasons, and to get or to build one's material situation, wealth or things that stabilize one's uh, material situation in the world, people come to Krishna consciousness. But it's not the highest reason. But Krishna can accept one because Krishna says anyone who comes to me for whatever reason, he calls him Mahatma. Samahatma Sadurlabaha. But the point is, is that that brings you into the process of devotional service. A person is meant to practice devotional service and understand what devotional service is meant to give you. What is that? Ultimately, purification of the heart and love of God. So if they're not coming to that at least theoretical stage of understanding this is what a devotional service is about, because that's why we explain these things over and over, and they still come and keep their desire, after some time they will go away. Because they, and sometimes they get their wealth, and then when they get their wealth, or they get some stability in life, then they go away. But the idea is to give them a higher taste or show them what is actually the process of bhakti is to purify your heart and to go back home, back to Godhead, to develop love for Krishna. That is the only goal of devotional service. 
So when we see a person is like that, uh, we try to inspire them in the process. And then if a person can get a higher taste, then they can leave these other lower tastes behind. The idea is to try and inspire devotees to get that higher taste. Because Krishna consciousness is the higher taste. It's sweet once we practice it properly. Mm -hmm. And the essence of that sweetness is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord <laughs> in the association of others. So, yeah, many come, but many don't stay <laughs> because they maintain material desires. That's why it says in the, the Ten Offenses to the Holy Name is the number 10 is to maintain material desires even after understanding so many instructions on this matter. To have material desires is not a disqualification. To try to fulfill material desires is. <laughs> We allow anyone to come and take part, but the idea is it's a purification, it's a bath. It's getting rid of those things that are actually causing you suffering in this material world. Because even if you get wealth, is there any guarantee you'll be happy? <laughs> even if you get that partner you want in life, is there any guarantee you'll be happy? Even if you get that job that you've been looking for, is there any guarantee you'll be happy? Nothing materially can, can guarantee you any happiness. But what we project on it, according to our understanding, is that this will give me happiness. And therefore, we go for it because we, have, we perceive that in that way. And when it doesn't give us happiness, then we become frustrated. <laughs> But we can guarantee one thing, Krishna consciousness will give you happiness. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. <laughs> if you practice it properly under the guidance of a spiritual master. And it doesn't matter what your position is in the world. You can always be happy in Krishna consciousness if you take to the process with enthusiasm. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Is there anything else? Okay, hmm. uh, we've been offering devotees this wonderful book. It's by one devotee called Mahatma. I think many of you have it. It's called Japa, 20 Affirmations in Japa, How to Improve Your Japa. And this, as far as my experience is, this is the best I've come across out of all the things that are designated to give us, uh, what we say, an increase in both our enthusiasm to chant and our uh, ability to chant. So it's a nice little book. An affirmation means a statement of fact. I will do this. That means it's already done. <laughs> so... We've been talking about it every class, so I have some more copies here. The book is free, but if you want to give a donation, that's also very nice. So anyone who didn't get a book and would like a book, I don't want to force it on you, but if you would like one, please come up and get one. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.